Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Cassie Dorf. I'm an assistant professor of political science at Vanderbilt University, and I run the OPSC along with Brad Smith, who is also an assistant professor of political science at Vanderbilt University. We're really excited. Today we have a great presentation, Shoot a Stranger, Save a Neighbor, Civilian and Combatant Networks Under Fire by Matthew Simonson at Northeastern University. He is a PhD candidate there, also currently on the market. And we also have some wonderful discussants who will be uh, discussing this paper with us today. Before we dive into that, I just wanna say a little bit about what you are watching, uh, whether this is later online or whether this is live right now. This is the OPSC, which is the Online uh, Peace Science Colloquium. And really our goal is to have a rigorous conversation, a great quality workshopping of papers before and after our Peace Science Society meetings, which happen annually. You can learn more about us online. You can go to the Peace Science website, peacescience.unt.edu, and navigate your way over to the OPSC. Um, and like I said, we record these and we post them online for everyone to get to watch. So I think now I will introduce our discussants. And if I say your name, you can just wave. Um, we have Connor Huff from Rice University. We have Joe Young from American University and Sabina Chahich from Stockholm University. And thank you so much for your time. I know that this is um, a hard time of year for folks with a lot going on. And so we just really value you. We value the intellectual contribution that you're making by joining us to, to discuss Matt's paper today. So our presenter today, Matt, will talk for about 15 minutes. Then we'll collect some big picture comments from our discussant and try to get a conversation going. If you are watching this live and you'd like to add a question or comment into the discussion, you can just put that into the chat. I'll check it out. And if it sort of fits where we're at, I'll try to bring it into the discussion today. And if not, I'll save those and then we'll send them to Matt after the meeting. And I think with that, we are good to go. Matt, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. Alrighty. All right, see you that. Great. Yes, looks good. Okay, thank you, Cassie. Um, I'm Matthew Simonson. As Cassie said, I'm a PhD student at Northeastern, and this is my job market paper that comes out of my dissertation. So our story today begins in Bosnia, which prior to 1992 was a highly integrated society with widespread intermarriage and cross-group friendships, particularly in the cities, between Serbs, Croats, and Muslims. Yet these friendships were insufficient to prevent a bloody civil war and genocide. But the question remains whether these friendships still had some effect on the violence. In short, my dissertation asks, were these inter-ethnic friendships something that still mattered once the bullets started flying? In particular, did they lead people to rescue, protect, and assist those who were being persecuted? Now, some of you might imagine that helping persecutees during a genocide or civil war is a rather exceptional act one that only rare individuals like Oskar Schindler of Schindler's List or Paul Rusi Sabagina of Hotel Rwanda have the courage to engage in. But I'm gonna show you today that if we look beyond Hollywood worthy stories of mass rescue to smaller, less dramatic acts of assistance, cross group help is stunningly widespread. During the Bosnian war and genocide, I find that roughly one in three Bosnians gave or received help from a member of another ethnic group. Moreover, I'll argue that one of the primary predictors of becoming a helper is having a diverse pre-war network with ties that bridge the conflict cleavage. While networks are my focus today, they're not the only cause of helping, so I'm gonna demonstrate for you how they interact with widely studied factors through a theoretical framework I call cross-group social capital. Theory. We know from the past 15 years of micro-level research on civil war that networks play an important role in shaping civilian behavior. Networks drive mobilization and recruitment in genocides and rebellions. When it comes to combatant support, networks of civilians provide crucial information to counterinsurgents and logistical support to insurgencies. Most of these behaviors, however, tend to amplify violence. Thus, we might ask whether networks also play a role in averting it. One place we might look for evidence of this would be cross-group ties. However, the evidence so far has been decidedly mixed. 
We have evidence that tight-knit communities with dense social networks can actually give rise to vicious cycles of denouncement and revenge. But cross-group ties can also prevent riots. What remains largely unknown is whether they lead to a category of behaviors I call cleavage-defying behaviors. This would include uh, ethnic defection, community resistance, and lastly, cross-group assistance, which is what I am focused on here today. There has been some research that shows that cross-group assistance is probably motivated by um, cross-group ties, um, but all this research to date basically comes from two cases, the Holocaust and the Rwandan genocide, and it's entirely focused on dramatic acts of life-saving rescue. And I wanna to look today at another kind of conflict, uh, Bosnia, which in some areas resembled a civil war and other areas and periods of time resembled genocide um, to expand our universe of cases and also adv advance the phenomena under study from life-saving rescue to a broad array of acts of help and assistance that may or may not have saved someone's life, but we're still defying the conflict cleavage. We're still providing some sort of alleviation of suffering or some sort of help to people in danger. So psychologists, historians, sociologists have identified a broad array of causes for rescue and assistance. I'm going to present to you a theory here that integrates these causes through the lens of social capital. To begin, there are many definitions of social capital, and I'm going to choose a definition that is best suited to our purposes today. I'm going to define social capital as your ability to get help from others. And when I say help, this could be borrowing a lawnmower from a neighborhood, from a neighbor, it could be getting advice from a neighbor, it could be very mundane acts, or it could also be seeking shelter from a mob during a pogrom. Now, what predicts cross-group assistance? The literature tells us that there's basically three broad categories of factors that lead to assistance. Um, first, there's capacity. So one person might have wealth, another person might have skills, another person information, and so forth. But whether or not you can access these you know, useful resources in your community is going to not just depend on whether these people have these abilities and these resources. It's going to depend on whether you can reach them. It's going to depend on the social network. So imagine this picture, you're represented by the blue circle, and then you have one friend. This one friend is the person I labeled informed, and they can give you information, but all the other things you might need to survive are three steps away from you. However, suppose you're friends with Mr. Popular. Mr. Popular is friends with everybody in the network, so he might be able to help you get whatever you need. Of course, it's gonna depend on the willingness of those other neighbors to share. So perhaps the supportive neighbor is courageous and open-minded, but a powerful neighbor is reluctant to take risks. But here again, the network can compensate. A stronger friendship might be sufficient to overcome the powerful neighbor's reluctance. Thus, my social capital framework brings together the three sets of causes from the literature, capacity, networks, and willingness. Today, however, I'm gonna focus on one of these, networks. So holding capacity and willingness constant, what kind of network structures should affect assistance? In this diagram, we might think that A and D have equal amounts of social capital. They're equally well positioned to get help because they have all these different friends. Their immediate network looks identical, but this is failing to take into account the ethnic identities of the people involved. So to put the social capital literature in conversation with the literature on identity and imagined communities, we're gonna color these nodes according to whether they are from the persecuted group or the per group that is doing the persecuting. So imagine now that node A is trying to get help from the oranges. A is clearly in a much better position now than D is because A is surrounded by outgroup members, whereas D is surrounded by in-group members. And so when it comes to specifically cross-group help, we say A is the best position, followed by B, then C, and then D, and then everyone else. Cross-group social capital, therefore, is the ability to get assistance from the outgroup. We now come to two hypotheses. Cross-group assistance ought to be more likely in the presence of more cross-group ties and stronger cross-group ties. So let's get down to testing these. During the uh, 
2018 and 2019 year, I spent 10 months in Bosnia conducting field work. After training several first time local research assistants, I traveled around the country conducting 160 interviews with Muslims, Serbs, and Croats, the vast majority of whom had stories of assistance uh, from the last war. I'm now in the midst of conducting a nationwide door-to-door -door survey on social networks and wartime assistance. While prior researchers have conducted surveys of identified Holocaust rescuers and maybe a control group to go with them, this is the first survey to estimate the frequency of rescuing and help in the general populace in a post-war state. The full survey with 2000 participants is on hold because of the pandemic. However, I do have results for you today from the pilot study, which the survey firm and I conducted using the exact same stratified sampling technique. The sampling frame consists of Bosnian residents who were old enough to have had friends before the war. In the appendix of my paper, I run sensitivity checks to show that my results are not substantially affected by outmigration or deaths during or after the conflict. The survey forum reports that participation rates were similar to those of surveys on less sensitive topics and that only one person broke off during the survey. Now for the main results. My survey enumerators asked respondents whether they had given or received the following six types of assistance. Providing documents such as an ID or exit permit, intervening in an attack or arrest, warning of an imminent threat, transportation to safety or medical care, a place to live or briefly hide, and provisions such as food, clothes, or cash. All told, assistance turned out to be remarkably widespread even with the wide confidence intervals introduced from a small sample size, we can say with 95% confidence that between 20% and 40% of Bosnians gave or received some form of assistance. Does this seem credible? I would say it does for a few reasons. First of all, the order of the types of help matches our expectations. So documents, you need to be you know, in the civil service probably to be able to provide those. Intervention is a pretty risky, bold act. Those things are rare. Whereas sharing food or having a house to like hide someone in, those are things that a lot of people have access to. So the order of these things seems to match our expectations. Secondly, um, while we might worry about social desirability bias, in Bosnia, it often goes the other direction today, that people are actually ashamed or afraid to admit to a survey taker from their own ethnic group that they helped the so-called enemy during the war. So while there may be some people who are trying to make themselves look heroic, there's also a lot of social pressure to not look heroic. And lastly, just living in Bosnia and telling people what I was doing, I heard stories of help left and right. You know, I would say to the rental car, you know, agent, oh yeah, here's what I'm doing in Bosnia. And said, oh yes, like my uncle was rescued in the war. Someone at the survey firm had a connection, my first landlord, my first taxi driver. So it's, well, I can't promise you that the rate of assistance is exactly 30%. My qualitative observations confirm that this is not a super rare behavior. It is certainly something that had some degree of commonness in the population. So now to look at the two hypotheses. What made helping more likely? Well, Let's take a look at these first three coefficients up top. The rest are control variables for assistance and capacity. So I measured cross-group ties a couple different ways. One way was an identity roster where I gave people a list of Bosnian names that had a clear Serb or um, Croat or Muslim um, affiliation to them. And I said, does this name ring a bell? Did you, meet, did you know someone by this name before the war? And so using that as a way to measure you know, cross-group ties that people remember from 25 years ago, um, we find that yes, cross-group ties lead to more assistance. Then using a more traditional social network um, instrument, I say, names to me some friends uh, from back then, from school, from work, and from so forth. So that's the name generator question. And then I infer from the name, the ethnicity of the person. And so it turns out with that metric also, we see as a positive correlation between assistance and knowing people from the out group before the war. And lastly, if we want something that's really going to be much more robust to memory loss and memory biases, I ask, were there mixed marriages in your family? And that too, although has a wider confidence interval, is a positive and significant correlation. Um, receiving help is similar. The mixed marriages one isn't significant here, but the other two continue to be up at the top. 
and there end up being more control variables for statistical reasons I'll go into later. Um, however, tie strength, the second hypothesis, surprisingly does not seem to matter. So when we look um, at the um, you know, cross-group ties by themselves, we have a positive and significant correlation. When we break it down into strong ties or weak ties, we see that the interval doesn't change that much. The point estimate doesn't change that much. It doesn't seem to matter whether we're measuring just the strong ties they had with their close friends or the weak ties with their acquaintances. All of these estimates are about the same. And so it seems like the strength of friendships might not actually matter so much as to whether you get assistance. Now, briefly, I'll show off a little bit of my qualitative data by going into a couple of mechanisms before I close. So one possible mechanism that networks are playing here is selection. So in you know, selecting who you're going to help or who you're going to ask for help. And so I talked to Amr, a Muslim taxi driver from Sarajevo, who told me about a day when a battalion of Serb soldiers were retreating from the city and were taken prisoner um, and later massacred. As he passed a group of POWs on the street, he spotted a former colleague. Amr states, there were a lot of people who needed help at that time, and I knew I could not help everyone, but I wanted to help him, the person he knew. Amr told the guard that this particular prisoner was someone he knew from before the war and asked to be given custody. The guard relented and Amr smuggled his friend to safety. So this is sort of an ideal case of selection. A would-be helper had multiple people to choose from and he chose to help the person who he had a network tie to. The other mechanism is recruitment. And here's where in-group ties can also come into play. So the initial helper might recruit other people from his or her or their own group to help out. For instance, Anya, a Serb woman from Sokolats, was hiding a Muslim neighbor named Sima in her house. The local militia showed up, spotted Sima running out the back door, and told Anya they would kill them both if Sima was there when they returned. Anya told me, we called a neighbor and he came here with a car. He drove Sima to a village where she spent the night. Early in the morning, he drove her all the way to safety. Thus, while Anya lacked the capacity, she didn't have a car, she was able to summon that capacity by calling on her in-group network ties. And to go back to the title of this talk, save and shoot a stranger, save a neighbor, those aren't mutually exclusive behaviors. People can still be genocidaires, they can still be involved with the killing, and they can kill you know, strangers while saving someone they care about. And I even heard this from several people, you know, a particular um, interviewee, um, a Muslim man, Fahir from Elijah told me, there were many people who went to the point of being war criminals, but they were very good to their own neighborhood. So to conclude, um, since we're right at time, um, I showed you today that cross-group assistance was widespread, that more cross-group assistant, more cross-group ties lead to more cross, or associated with cross-group assistance, but that these ties need not be strong. And lastly, we have two potential mechanisms, selection and recruitment through which these networks operate. So I'd like to thank my mentors and my funders, as well as the Post-Conflict Research Center where I was affiliated during my year in Sarajevo. Thank you all very much. Thanks so much, Matt. I think now you can finish sharing your screen and we'll go ahead and open up this discussion and we'll start with some comments from Joe Young. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks, Matt, for sending us such a impressive paper. Uh, I think, first of all, I love the basic social network approach and I, I feel like it's not done enough, um, especially in political science, but kind of in, in academia, um, more more broad based. And I think, you know, you're doing it in such a rigorous way. That's, that's impressive. Um, I also really love that you're triaging your information from a lot of different sources. Um, which, you know, you're bringing in interview data, survey data, you know, observ observable uh, or observational data. You know, what you spend a little bit of time in the paper sort of apologizing for the fact that you don't have good, quote unquote, causal estimates. And I, for me, it's like, I don't care that you have such cool da data from lots of different sources that, you know, it's and, and th we can have a larger discussion about this. I'm sure other people may disagree. But I got really frustrated with um, the sort of strict causal identification crowd, especially in this kind of context, where um, you know you're bringing in information from all sorts of places, and it, it brings a lot of um, more confidence in me that these are appropriate estimates and that we're, we're gaining some information. Uh, 
I th think the biggest issue for me is kind of two things. And luckily, I think they're pretty easy to fix. One is that I'm still not clear on what the alternative story is. You sold me what your story is, but I'm not sure, you know, is, is it that you're just kind of adding a little piece to the story or is there some dominant conventional wisdom that you're saying you you all are just wrong? Because I, I, I think a unfair characterization is just like, oh, okay, you're confirming Grana better. Great. All right. Um, so, you know, what what is that? And I think it would be helpful to know that and, and, and helpful to say that more in the paper. Um, and then the other thing I think uh, is I'm not quite sure about what the best presentation order is in the paper. And so right now you kind of have the big quant stuff up front and then the mechanism interview data towards the back end. And I'm not sure that's the right way to do it. Um, and I, I'd be interested in what other people think on this too. But for me, it's kind of like that interview data kind of helps you develop your hypotheses and, and inform your theory. I mean, it's very much a cycle, right? And I almost, that stuff's more interesting probably for a general audience anyways. Um, and I, I, part of me thinks that, you know, talk, talk about your argument and your theory, bring in some of that um, rich qualitative research and then then do the sort of bigger piece and then wrap up, you know, with the extensions. And so, uh, like I said, I, I think both of those are pretty easy to fix, but I, I think they take away from a, um, an otherwise really impressive piece. And then I guess the last thing I'll say, and then I'll pass it, I'll, I'll pass the mic, um, is that you got a lot going on, right? This is a complicated, this is a very complicated Olympic dive, let's say. And uh, I think it, different places and I don't know the best way to simplify it, but I think if you could simplify it in some some ways, either moving things to appendices or like taking a piece out knowing that, you know, this is your baby and I'm asking you to like chop off its arm, um, taking maybe pieces of it and, and putting it to, to the side so that so the main point can kind of come through. So those are some thoughts, but I'm, I'm excited to, to hear everybody else's thoughts and to chat more about this. Thanks. I'll just say very briefly in terms of chopping up the baby. Um, this is a book project as well. So I'm fine taking out whatever needs to take out of the paper version to get it published. It can always go in the long form later. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I agree with um, Joe's comments. Um, and so I think, you know, just thinking about your paper, you're explaining um, this fascinating phenomenon that I think is interesting both from a social science perspective and thinking about the choices of individuals to help one another or not in violent conflict settings. I think that's broadly of interest to political scientists, but also just from like a human perspective where these are people engaging in heroic actions in co violent conflict settings. And so I found that to be one of the really kind of appealing and I think fascinating parts about your project. And you really have, as Joe said, rich sources of data from a variety of sources. And I think that's a, a, a you know, a great part of the project that'll make for great fodder for a broader book. Um, so I think I have just several high level comments. And my first one just echoes directly what Joe ended with, which is that there's a lot of moving pieces here. And that's partly because this is a job market paper that's squishing down a whole book into one thing. Um, and so I think we'll all have different opinions about like where you should both beef out and cut. Um, but for me, I think focusing the, the, the qualitative information a bit more and you might I think maybe Joe was alluding to this, but you might imagine you actually move some of that forward into the theory, kind of like pepper your theory with these quotes directly. That might be one approach for doing that. Um, and second is when and how you should include all these robustness checks that you currently have. So um, I can imagine that you kick a lot of that stuff to the appendix, but that's something that I think um, could be part of the broader discussion. Because to me, the real selling point is you're going to end up with this like super fascinating survey on 2000 people in a post-conflict setting that's really rich and exploring this new topic. So to me, that's like what the core kind of empirical contribution will be. Um, okay, so now I just have some um, some other kind of theoretical and empirical uh, comments and questions as well. And as well. So whenever I read these kind of like networky, um, uh, like network type explanations, I have this lurking question in my head of like what's causally upstream from the networks and why they developed in the ways that they do. So in particular, you have this theoretical argument that centrals or set, like centers around a cross-group social capital. And presumably there's something that's driving variation for either individuals, like I have more cross-group social capital than say Joe, um, or between people who live in different places. And to me, that was just this kind of like lurking question throughout the entirety of the paper that um, 
I, you know, I don't have a great sense of whether that should be in this paper or um, the broader book, but it's something that I would think about addressing more in a head-on, um, a head-on way. Um, and um, so I would encourage you to flesh that out a bit more. Um, and this ties directly into thinking about um, the empirical design for the project. So you have these kind of control variables that you think of as being perhaps like things that affect that, the, the development of the network. But I struggled at times with thinking about whether they were um, causally upstream from the network or downstream. Um, and so in particular, um, you have these control variables for um, the number of civilians killed as a proxy for the level of victimization. And so I can imagine that the strength of my local network determines how many civilians are killed in my area, in which case it's actually like a post-treatment variable and we shouldn't be including it in our specifications. And so I kind of had this like going back and forth um, throughout the kind of the entirety of the empirical design. And again, I think part of it is that there's so many rich theoretical moving pieces here. Um, the more structure you can impose theoretically, um, I think the easier it'll be to, to follow. Um, and then I just had, you know, some other concerns kind of about, um, not, I shouldn't say concerns, but questions about the sampling approach here. And part of it is because I think you glossed it over because you have this whole like pandemic crisis that occurred. Um, but, you know, I think what, if the selling point for this is going to be this kind of like, I have this crazy sample, then you're going to want to do a lot more handholding for how the sample is constructed, who, can, who conducted it. Um, if we think the one in three number is accurate, then we're going to want to be super purposive about like, okay, 75% participation. What does that actually mean, right? The types of person who might be like, you know, the ones who's going to assist a random survey taker might be the types who are also more likely to assist random people. Um, and so you can imagine that le that's leading to like an, a biased overestimate of your main, your main kind of findings. Um, so I think I'll end there, but those are just kind of the main, my main high level takeaways. And thanks again for a super interesting paper. Thank you. Yeah, my turn now. Well, Matthew, I think I believe we spoke just before you went on that trip. And I was very, very, very pleased uh, and excited, you know, reading what came out from it. And, and as I told you, you know, when that was, I don't remember anymore, two years ago or something, when we spoke, last time we spoke, um, uh, this is an extremely important topic. It is an extremely important question beyond your own research, beyond the field of political science. This is important for the fact that it has the potential to really give another perspective on, on human morality or human immorality, right? Because you are actually looking at the moral behavior and the moral actions at times, right? When we, when we think of those times, we actually only think in terms of immorality and any moral actions that took place. So you're actually completely shifting the coin here, not just on how we view the human behavior and the conflict, but how, how we actually think, right? Or in general of intergroup relations and intergroup behavior. And I find this question, as I told you before, um, extremely, extremely important with extremely important implications, right? that can come and stem from this research. And that is one, one definitely one aspect that, that you could uh, elaborate more on, right? On what does this really mean and what could be the specific, not just theoretical, but, but also societal, right? Implications of this kind of um, insights, you know, that, we, that you have come to, you know, I was, I was surprised, I myself am from Bosnia. But I was surprised, pleasantly surprised to read that, you know, 30% of Bosnians have either received or given help, right? I mean, that number, I have never seen that number, right? We, 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 we heard stories sporadically, occasionally, but seeing and hearing and reading that number, you know, to me, you know, that, 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 that surprised me, you know, and surprise, you know, a, a surprising people has the potential to <laughs> violate the expectations, right? And violating expectations has, has the potential to change intergroup perceptions and intergroup attitudes and intergroup behaviors. So I think you have a lot of um, a lot of um, a lot of potentially that you can still elaborate on. Whether you're going to do this in this paper or in the book, and so that's another story. But I think there's definitely um, a lot of room um, to to expand on this. I really, um, as I said, I really, really enjoyed this for, for many reasons that were already already outlined. Another particular aspect, and again, I'm here talking now as a social psychologist, 
is um, what I, I mean, the similarities that I saw, and this is something that maybe I have missed, but again, I'm a social psychologist, uh, that maybe you can touch upon the social psychological literature on intergroup contact and intergroup helping. And there is a lot of and wide literature on this, right? That shows, that demonstrates um, the ties, right? Or the relationship that as you have demonstrated, you know, we call it intergroup contact and we might conceptualize it in a slightly different way, but essentially they are comparable, right? Concepts and, and the intergroup helping as, as, a, as, a, as a variable or an outcome that you're looking at. So I think that could uh, definitely be um, something that you would, you wanna tie in you know, as, 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 as an added, um, in, you know, disciplinary kind of angle to this. And there you would, you would not necessarily, again, I'm talking from our perspective, social psychological, there you would not necessarily say anything new, right? Because we kind of already research shows how contact is beneficial, <laughs> how group ties are beneficial potentially for intergroup, you know, helping in this case, but intergroup relations in general, et cetera, et cetera. However, what I think is, is, is new or what could be an added, you know, from your research when you compare it to social psychological research, particularly on contact, is that you're going a little further and then you're looking at these specific predictors, right, of those cross group ties. So what actually is making people, right, or what, you know, what are the conditions that make people engage or have more cross group ties, right, and this is something where social psychological literature hasn't moved a lot, right? And I think this is definitely that you can point out as an added <laughs> almost um, knowledge, right? To the social science literature in that sense. And I really, really enjoyed reading that. And another aspect that is also not just that, that is where it deviates, let's say, from the social psychological literature in interesting ways is uh, in almost all work on contact, we're finding that the strength of cross, cross group ties, or the, we call it quality <laughs> of, of contact, is important, right? That it is actually without the quality, we can move things forward at the intergroup level. You're not finding that in this case, right? You're not finding that the strength is as important right as 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 it could have been predicted that it's necessary that it's enough that the, the condition of just having the network right is sufficient for these things to move forward and i think there you have another point where you can kind of diverge not diverge from but where you can develop further right the 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 literature the literature on again tying it back to social psychological literature so i think there is a lot of um, it's great this is amazing and this is this is this is an ocean of, of, of research that's going to flow from this right and uh, uh the, but there is so much room to um tie it more and develop it more and do more work of course obviously um uh, on and what i would um just um, also add as another, what I particularly liked was the way you measured, <laughs> um, you measured, conceptualized and measured gross group ties. Again, I'm looking at it from our perspective of how we do these things, you know, and I really, really, uh, it, it was a much deeper, <laughs> you know, much more, you know, subtle, deeper, nuanced way to, to really capture this, 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 this phenomenon, right, of, of social network. And I really, really enjoyed that as well. So this is just in a nutshell uh, for me, but, uh, but um, uh, overall, you know, I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, Cassie, should I start the discussion? Uh, yeah. So um, Sabina, one thing I'm curious about um, from your perspective as a social psychologist is um, did the memory biases and the fact that I'm asking these questions 30 years later, does that jump out to you as problematic that I'm missing something? I mean, look, you know, yes, it can be problematic as any self-reported <laughs> measure can be problematic in that sense, right? So yes, right? You know, any self-reported measure has its limitations, but has its advantages too, right? So you're just, you know, I don't think yours is necessarily more disadvantaged than any other 
classical <laughs> survey self-reported questions and measures are. So I would not necessarily um, you know, worry about that other than just saying what, 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 what those are. But as you said, and I think, and that is very correct because I have been asked myself oftentimes about the social desir desirability question, right? Like what if your participants are actually just giving, because I've measured a lot of acknowledgement, responsibility, acceptance uh, for the conflict, et cetera, you know, and people always ask me, you know, how are how are you controlling for social desirability, you know, um, you know, levels um, in your measures? And 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 it's very true, as you said, you know, in Bosnia, it is this it's almost an absence, unfortunately, right? But, but it's almost an absence of these social desire, desirable kind of guiding behavioral norms, you know, uh, because when you look at the levels of 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 or at the simple mean levels of certain as of certain measures that you would expect to be high because of social desirability you see they're extremely low because people don't care you know they they actually really do express or are feel they feel free to express you know uh, engage even in un socially undesirable responses you know because of the environment and as, as you know you know you spend some time there so actually you know the, the, the limitations are as with any 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 self-reported measures that we all have and face you know Thank you. Can I, can I ask a follow-up? Um, so I, I, this is kind of a, a theoretical question for Matthew, but also I think a broader point of discussion for the group, which is you make this choice in the paper to pool over individuals who give assistance and then also receive assistance. And I can imagine that those are kind of different choices um, being made um, that you could theorize differently um, uh, or not. Um, and so I was curious for, um, Kind of why you thought about in that way and then um group i'd be curious for your thoughts about that as well so it's entirely a practical choice based on sample size so i guess a broader question that that's part of is really you know assuming that there continues to be a you know pandemic through the summer and i want to try to publish something or get something under review before then um should i you know move forward with what i have um, you know, or should I just try to put forward a purely qualitative study with dropping the survey? Um, you know, knowing that like, you know, in the long term, I'll have the bigger survey, I'll be able to differentiate between helping and then receiving stuff. I'll be able to differentiate by ethnic group. I'll be able to do a lot more when I have more power. Um, Wait, yeah. Sorry, so, I don't understand your answer to my question though, which is like, if the way I thought about it was that um, you could ask any given individual whether they um, gave or received assistance, and those would be two different outcome questions. And so, like, that wouldn't be affected by statistical. Like, you're not gaining statistical power by pooling those, right? Um, um, I gain statistical power because, you know, I think it's like 20% of people gave help and 15 got help. And there's some overlap. And so when I combine those two, now I have 45 people or 30 people who are involved in help. And that gives me the power to have, right? Like a say assistance was common. Um, so if I had a bigger sample, I would not do any of that pooling. I'd do it all as separate tables, separate graphs. Okay. There, there's also a third option though, Matt, where, um, you know, if, if we're in this, and I, I feel sorry for everyone who's on the market, I should just like say that to everyone. Um, and then also feel sorry for everyone in your situ situation who's trying to do, an, I, I, you know, research in a foreign country during a pandemic. Um, but I, I think a third option is to try and do some type of media men analysis. And that is, you know, and it could be, uh, you know, as simple as kind of creating a, a causal model where you sort of show the different stages where this occurs and then you show some vignettes of where people are talking about these these kind of changes in the in the model um i mean there are more formal ways to do this like i don't know if you know qca or there's a, a more formalized um, cna process that you can do in r um and that won't require so many observations and are you know not um you know obviously when you get to 2000 you could you do the um, more the other approaches, but I mean, you could kind of take that more me medium and approach if you're trying to get this out for publication now. Uh, but I, I think you're not going to be able to publish this right as as the with a hundred cases, kind of similar to what Connor was saying. 
just to clarify a little on Connor's question, yeah, you're right. So uh, uh, the overall N isn't affected by whether I pool or not. I guess I was pooling to make sure that I had a confidence interval for my main thing that wasn't going to come too close to zero that people would be like, oh, I don't know. It's like, you know, five to 15 percent or something like that, or, you know, two to 14 percent. So I, I guess um, I don't have to do anything. I did all my regressions separate. Um, I just did the, the descriptives of the outcome um, pooled, but I, I could show all those as broken down by giving and receiving. I, I just, okay, so um, bracketing that conversation, um, I, the, I'd be curious for people's thoughts on like the relative upside of these different types of approaches and in particular like the upside of the medium and approach, Joe, that you just proposed versus kind of holding off and waiting. And I know like it's super hard right now with the job market constraints, obviously like, you know, we gotta do stuff. Um, but ignoring constraints to me, like the upside of this, um, the broader sample is very big. Um, and so I think that is a very compelling part of your project. So I think like kudos to that. I'm really sorry you're in this position. Mm -hmm. I think I did just want to flag that, that I think like the upside there is super high and you kind of have this ability to like almost have like a pre-registered version of the observation or, you know, whatever you have now. Right. Um, which is kind of cool. So, um, I don't know what to give you practical advice, but just mm -hmm. like, I think the upside of the broader project is quite high. And where would you want to, I mean, it you're searching for jobs mainly in political science, all fields, and you're. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I'd I'd want to aim for you know AJPS or APSR. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So so yeah, I mean the the I was it struck earlier in the conversation when both of you mentioned the idea of foregrounding the qualitative stuff. You know, I mean, I, I order the way I did because this is just how I often see papers in political science is that they go into their quant stuff and they say, oh, and now here's some like, you know, illustrations of it or, or you know, mechanisms. But I could foreground the qualitative stuff, say this is mostly a qualitative paper. And now we have this little pilot survey to show that the things I'm finding seem to be common um, and, and leave it at that and then save the most of the, you know, regression stuff for another paper once I have a big survey. So if I could also jump in on this conversation about the paper and the ordering and, and your different incentives, I agree with everyone else. It's hard times, it's hard to figure out which constraint that you're facing right now in your career to respond to, I think that's very serious. Um, but let's talk about it perhaps as a job market paper. And I will tell you right now, my job market paper is under review and I have been in jobs for a while. So maybe I shouldn't record that and put that on the internet, but it is, I had a different paper for my dissertation that came out much faster, but it wasn't actually the one I mainly interviewed with. Um, and so I guess I share that to be encouraging in the sense that, you know, you work on a paper and you, you do sometimes have to think of it more in stages. And I think if you're on the market and you're trying to have a really compelling paper, people will read your job market paper and they're going to come to your talk. And so order it and, and, and write it in a way that makes sense for that and less like, how can I squeeze out a publication, you know, while I'm on the market? Um, you have other papers in your, in your dissertation package that might be relevant for publication now. And that's kind of the situation I was in. And so I think it's okay to think of this a little bit more as how can I be internally consistent? And I think the question that Connor brought up was a, a bit of a question I had with the paper and was a little bit confused on some of the, the empirical choices, but I think you're dealing with this data problem where you can't go out and collect all the data you thought you would. And it's gonna confuse and muddle your, the, the clearness, the clarity of your, your theoretical part of the paper. I think when you have to sort of make these choices in the empirics just to deal with the data the constraints that you do have. And so instead trying to be really strong from the get go on, on your theory and on the contribution and the framing, and then using what evidence you do have with the caveat, which most people will understand, like that you currently cannot feel, you know, feel the rest of that. So I just kind of wanted to flag thinking about it maybe a little bit more long-term. That's helpful. Um, uh, most of you seem to echo this sentiment that the strength of the paper is the richness and variety of the data sources. And yet, of course, this paper is about as twice as long as a 10,000 word journal article. Um, and so, and I run into all these 
you know, everything people suggest, like, you know, uh, Sabina says I should bring in the air group contact literature. Well, I was like, oh yeah, well, I used to have a whole paragraph on like, from like Gordon Allport up to Pettigrew and Troop and like, you know, the whole like history of that literature and even like the new stuff from Palette Green and Green and I, I cut it out, you know, and and from what Connor was saying about the like, um, the survey methodology, like, oh yeah, no, I used to have like, pretty de detailed stuff about like, you know, sampling, stratified sampling techniques. And, and I took that out because like length. Um, and, and so, so that's, uh, everyone faces that dilemma, I guess. Um, but one, I guess, more serious thing at the moment as I try to cut it down is in some ways, um, the, the richness of the data is, someone's coming in in those robustness checks, right? I have these robustness checks where, I use the Bosnian Book of the Dead to measure ethnic defection. And I use this intermarriage data to look at ethnic defection and community resistance, right? I mean, those are things that would then get shoved to the appendix. And now I'm just down to interviews and survey, which maybe that's enough, but like, you know, in some ways the things that are most natural to cut end up now trimming the variety of data sources that are in the main paper as opposed to the appendix. But Matthew, just one question. I mean, I don't know how it is in polit policy, you know, <laughs> you know, world. But, but um, why does it have to be all in one paper? I mean, you know, why can't you separate this, you know, into three different papers? Well, you know, in one paper where you would pitch your, you know, theoretical model, you know, where, for example, we do this in current directions of psychological science. We pitch our idea. You know, it's, these are usually very, very short. You know, but very, very influential. You know, kind of outlets and papers where we pitch it, and then we would test a part of the model. You know, with with survey data. You know, and then we would publish that. You know, in a, in, a, in a, again targeted journal. You know, and then we would have okay. We don't. We might not have so much qualitative data. You know, publications, but you know, then we have some experimental data. You know. Which would then be a third paper kind of thing, but they're of course they're all connected, you know. So, so I don't, I just don't know why it all has to be, you know, crunched, you know. And then when you separate it, then you can actually in your, in your, in your, for example, survey data, then you can actually really tap into different literature as well, you know, relevant literature, and then expand that aspect and then pitch that. I mean, I just don't know, you know, how how it how it usually goes when you're at that stage of your academic career, you know, in 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 this field, but we usually cut it, you know, in and 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 go with with you know on average three, you know, papers where which hypothetically your work actually contains, right? That you can unpack and then develop and then I just don't know if I'm putting more work on your on your table, but I'm just saying that it's plausible as well. I think uh what I'm one of the things I'm hearing and tell me if you're hearing the same thing, but it seems like uh, as a job market paper, and I think Cassie's points are fantastic here, like as a job market paper, you're, it's going to be quite different than what it's going to look like when you publish. And But as you know, if you're telling stories in your job market paper, and you're providing qualitative evidence, and you're providing a, a theory that people can grab onto, and maybe, you know, in ter this is a, in terms of emphasis, maybe a little less on the survey, because it's not here yet. And, and, you know, some of these other, uh, how it's going to be designed, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, I just think, in, in the job market talks that I, I've been to, people who tell really good stories, that generally sells a very diverse, you know, group. And so people are going to latch on to the really interesting stories, and especially if they fit with a compelling theory. Um, we all are going to realize you're not ready to field the whole survey for all the kinds of reasons. But that's like, that's, that's, uh, you know, potential. You're, then you're, you're selling us something that's going to even be better. Yeah, and Matthew, I just say you've gotten some feedback on kind of the project as a whole. The, a couple of other threads that I think all of your discussants um, mentioned. One was this um, question about the sort of um, process of the theory, like when the network fits in to the theoretical puzzle. I don't know if you want to talk about that, uh, you know, a little bit more. If there were other key threads that you uh, heard from, I think framing. What are you? Joe talked about, and maybe someone else did a little bit. But what are you really? Um, sh sort of showing the argument overturned or what, it, what does it push back or what does it confirm in this sort of broader uh, stories that we have in political science. So were there a couple of those things that you'd also like to get additional discussion going on? Yeah, both of those. Um, let's start with the second one first. Um, and I've gotten this uh, like feedback at job talks also is, 
is you know who who are you uh, arguing with here you know or is is, um, is this a really surprise is this actually a surprising finding um you know i'd say it's not just a confirmation of grand vetter's strength of weak ties because that finding is like okay when it's something relatively costless like telling people about a job opportunity you can get that kind of help from like your acquaintances um i mean to me it's always been fundamentally surprising or just like a common sense human being that people would risk their lives in a war to help someone from the enemy group who they don't know that well. Um, but is there a literature that says that common sense? Not that I've really found, although maybe what Sabina was saying is that I could really say I'm pushing back against the intergroup contact literature, which is you know, spans both psych and poli sci about how um, you know you need to meet these certain you know, four conditions for intergroup contact to be effective. You need to, you know, maybe that's the, the the thing I'm going against is the notion that intergroup contact has to be of a certain quality to be effective. But I mean, Connor, Joe, if you can, or Cassie, if any of you can think of like something that's more situated in political science and the civil world literature that this is a critique of or this is pushing back to, I'm just sort of at a loss for like, you know, what giant am I slaying here? I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't have a great answer for that, but I think the, the, I, I guess I'll just like restate my, my first comment, which was like, I really struggle with the kind of like what's causally upstream from these networks and why do they take the forms that they do? And to me, like, until, like, if you nail that question, then like how you hook into the literature will just flow naturally from that, um, um, would be how I would, would think about it. But I don't know if that's right because like frankly I don't do I don't write these network papers so I don't I don't know that. And Connor, do you think it'd help to have kind of a and not a formal model necessarily but just kind of a here's here's a pathway which my theory is operating and here's how I get from beginning to end. Yeah, I think that'd be great. And you know you kind of have it in figure 1 but it's like whenever arrows point into two different things rather than like in one direction, my head always explodes. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. And so I want like a one directional dag. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's what Joe calls the, uh, the apology section. Like, I'm sorry, it's all confounded. <laughs> I'm just gonna control for, I'm just gonna control for all. I mean, you know, my, my current strategy, I guess, Connor, is like, I just say, okay, I'm gonna give him a, a big five personality test and then control for all those personality facets because presumably extroversion and sociability are drivers of having more friends. So I'll just control for those things. Um, but I, I could really lay out one of those causal pathways saying like, you know, this, this, and this lead to more diverse networks. I'm controlling for this, this, and this. I guess another way to put it though, is in that theory section, you kind of have this like, here's some situational factors. Here's some individual level factors. And you're kind of agnostic about what the independent legwork each of those might do in shaping any given individual is the structure of which their network is formed or like why it takes the form that it does. But you can imagine that like in your particular case, you have a bunch of knowledge about which should actually matter and why. Um, so is it actually like all kind of situational things which vary kind of between regions um, in the country? Like that could be one type of explanation. Another is like, you're gonna double down on perhaps some like individual level or psychological factors that are shaping, you know, why I might go out and meet all these people. I'm super sociable, whatever, right? And that's a different type of explanation. Both of which could plausibly be true, but I don't actually know. Um, um, and so again, like I, I really want to caveat, but like I don't do this kind of network stuff that often. So like take all this to the grain of salt. But um, that would just be like how I would think about it. Um, well, you know, Cassie does do this kind of network stuff, and I think she's would probably say you're right, right? These are up, there are upstream things to worry about, right? <laughs> yeah, I would also say I was about to say this, and I decided not to, but now I will, which is. Connor, like us network people only get published if we convince Connor people that we make sense. So I think these these comments are helpful, right? Matthew, like it's okay, yeah. how do I need how do I frame this in a way? How do I write this in a way that is going to lodge itself, you know, in the way that people who don't do this buy it? Because it's it is about a larger process here. And I, I think it might just be be taking a step back to think where are you really fitting in? Um, and right now it reads that you just sort of fit in everywhere. Like there's so much, there's so much going on um, that it's kind of hard to, to see the main fit. And then your question earlier about what are you taking on? I mean, one, one thing you could, and I'm not sure exactly how you manufacture this and I'd be interested to see if other people think this is a terrible idea, but um, 
maybe to say something like this is taking on rationalist. I mean, you know, rationalist arguments for war, are the, what are, is the conventional wisdom and you have rationalist kind of explanations for civil war. And now, you know, within that context, why do people ever decide to do these pretty non-rationalist things? Right. I mean, why would you actually help anyone during civil war? It makes no sense. Yeah, that, that actually taps into that literature about like, you know, people are, you know, switching sides for survival or free riding isn't really free. Um, so I, I could tap into that vein of, you know, critiquing, you know, rational agent models. Yeah, I also think there's a fair amount, and I know you know this literature, Matthew, um, a fair amount of intuition in the qualitative literature on how networks and social capital play a role in mobilizing political behavior within context of violence. And maybe a frame for a project like this is as simple as saying, we, we don't have um, this formalized in a, in, in a way, or we haven't been able to collect a lot of quantitative data on this and that you're really inspired by the qualitative literature, like building, building a bridge to be able to say that. I'm, I'm not sure, but that's maybe another idea. You can, you can jot down all these possible framing ideas and then you know, choose your own adventure with it. But it, it definitely strikes me that it fits into a lot of that intuition um, that I know that you already know about. So were you thinking about ballot setting it up basically as like a horse race model where it's like some theories predict that like I'm more willing to help folks. Um, but of course, like it's costly to do so, so that might predict that um, they might be like, you know, I guess like not less likely to do so. Maybe you predict a null. Would that be how you were thinking about it? Yeah, um, right. Yeah, I, I think that's, yeah, that is sort of the easiest approach to, you know, challenging existing theory. <laughs> I don't always love that approach, but. I mean, I guess one way to think about it is, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the title of the paper, you know, acknowledges the fact that helping and hurting aren't opposites. So in some ways I can't just say, oh, well, all these people say networks are bad, I say they're good, because they can certainly be both. Um, so just before we close, I guess one other idea that occurred to me is, you know, you know, Sabina had this idea, you know, breaking it up into different papers that sort of undoes the strength of the paper, which is having multiple data sources in one place. If, if there's a way I could have all different data sources, but like a smaller question or a smaller phenomenon under investigations, maybe, you know, maybe one paper on you know, more ties, another paper on strength of ties. Um, and, and maybe before that, I could just even just spin out a research note link thing on here is the broader universe of helping that hasn't been examined. You know, we haven't looked at, we haven't looked beyond life-saving rescue. Here are the empirical phenomena I qualitatively saw in my research. Oh, that, there was one other thing I wanted to ask about. Um, which, and you brought it up earlier about kind of social desirability bias, but I wonder if, did you pilot anything in your um, surveys on kind of uh, how people were answering these sensitive questions, either, you know, some kind of a list experiment or endorsement, some way to get at whether people are be, being honest with you um, when they're giving you their, you know, their perspectives? Nothing, uh, I, in long story short, I, I had various things I tried, but I don't think I tried anything that was experimental like that. Um, I, I'll look back into that literature on list endorsement experiments because that, that certainly is a good technique. I, I think I would do that before you go to the big 2000. I mean, and, uh, you know, it, it can be helpful because if people are just giving you sort of the um, what you want to hear, then you can do some of these alternative ways to, to get at the sort of closer ground truth. Great, thank you so much. I think we are at our end of our workshop today. I um, want to thank Jennifer Barnes, our graduate assistant for helping us, Joe Young, Connor Huff, and Sabina Chahajik, Cha nope, Chahajik, Clancy. <laughs> thank you so much for teaching me how to say new words and for about amazing political science research as done by our presenter today, Matthew Simonson. This talk will be posted online um, you can find us at our website, which is really long, so I don't usually read it, but you can always email me if you can't find it. 
and I'll help send the link. So thank you all. It's so important for our scholars to be getting feedback right now, especially during a time where we're not often meeting at conferences. Um, so this is great. It's a great opportunity for, for Matthew, but also for all of us. And it's good to see you and meet some of you. So thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Bye everyone.